Um, I don't think they're racist. I don't think they're sexist, but I think they do bring God and country a bit too much together um, for my taste. And I, I think it's problematic. So you watch this documentary and you do see things that as a conservative Christian will make you cringe. Welcome to the program. This is Michael Easley in Context. And you know, we don't do this often. In fact, I don't think I've ever done this before, but I want to ask you a big favor. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, comment below. Tell us what you like about the program, what you want to hear about the program. And if you're not watching on YouTube, if you're listening through your podcast supplier, whether it's iTunes or however you access podcasts, if you'll go to the YouTube channel and we're going to give away a number of Mark's books free on the probably an, a certain number we haven't decided yet, but we're going to give quite a few books away free to you. If you give us a comment, Hey, I heard about the free book and it's going to be first come first serve, but that helps our, uh, helps you to learn. It also helps our engagement. And the last favor I want to ask you, uh, share this with a friend. This is an extraordinary interview that, uh, Dr. Hall and I are about to have. And I really want you to understand, uh, those thumbs up, those five-star reviews, those comments, share with a friend, make a big difference. Uh, this is all free. We give it away. But the point is getting this information out to other people to engage their thinking. So with, with all that uh, shameless self-promotion, uh, Dr. Mark David Hall is a friend. He's been on the program a number of times. Uh, I think this is your 10th book. Is that right, Mark? I have 15 books altogether if you count edited books. 15 books altogether, forgive me. He's a professor in the Regent University's Robertson School of Government and a senior fellow at the Center for Religion, Culture, and Democracy. Uh, the book we're going to talk about today, and we're also going to talk about Rob Reiner's uh, film, documentary, uh, his new book is called Who's Afraid of Christian Nationalism? Why Christian Nationalism is Not a Threat to American democracy or the church. And it's kind of come out in April. And again, if you don't hear Dr. Hall's information, as always, it's in the show notes. You can purchase the book anywhere you buy online um, and, and want to get this information. But let me start. First of all, I want to talk about the movie, but I really want to wait till the end. And I'm, uh, and this is kind of, is this Providence, Mark, that your book comes out about the time this film drops? <laughs> It could be. <laughs> you didn't know about this film in the making, right? No, I did not. I um, started the book probably a year and a half ago when I heard about the movie maybe four months ago. So, yeah, yeah this um, the project had started long before I heard of the movie. Well, this is a compelling book, and I was telling Mark a moment ago, um, I don't know if I'm getting older and my anxiety level changes, but I'm reading your book and my blood pressure is going up. I literally have a blood pressure cup on my desk where I check it for my doctor's benefit every day. And I'm going, wait a minute, I got to calm down. Here. <laughs> I'm getting so amped up reading this book. Um, first of all, uh, you've had an interest in this field of Christian nationalism for some time. For those that may, this, maybe this is the first time they've heard you, what got you started? And tell us a little bit about the roadmap. Yeah, thank you. So as you mentioned kindly before, I've done a lot of um, books and articles and this sort of thing, most of them focusing on the American founding or religious liberty, church-state relations throughout all of American history. So I really haven't worked that much on, on American history over the last 30 years, say. Um, on, on January 6, 2021, I was flying home from a speaking engagement, and I got a, an email from a reporter when I did a layover in, in Dallas, and she asked me to, to comment on the Christian symbols among the rioters at the U.S. Capitol. And this was the first I heard of it. So I said, oh, my goodness. Um, yeah, please send me some images, and I'd be happy to comment on them. It took her about 20 or 30 minutes to send me anything. So I used that time scrolling through the video that you could find available online, and what I saw, and I, I was horrified by the, by the attack on the Capitol, make no mistake about it, uh, but all I saw was a sea of American flags, a sea of Trump flags, a sea of MAGA hats, and no Christian images. Eventually, the reporter sent me four or five images, several of which did have signs that said God or Jesus saved or this sort of thing, but all of them were far from the U.S. Capitol. In, in fact, we know this. Some were taken with the Washington Monument right behind um, the people holding the signs and the Washington Monument is literally 1.5 miles from the Capitol. And so there was indeed a big pro-Trump rally that day and people had Christian flags, not a lot, but some 
and um, that sort of thing. But I think you need to distinguish between symbols at that rally and symbols among the rioters. When you actually look at the rioters, the symbol she sent me, one was a pine state flag, which has the words on it, an appeal to God, which could in fact come from um, in the book of Judges, or it could come from Locke's second treaties of government. And of course, it's a revolutionary era flag. So you could see how um, some of the quote unquote patriots who attacked the Capitol could be thinking in terms of the war for American independence, just like they had the don't tread on me flag. And really the only explicitly Christian symbol was this crazy goth-like person holding a, a, a copy of the Bible in front of the the, the, the rioters. And I'm a church going creature. I've been in churches my whole life and I've never seen someone dressed up like this goth guy. They don't come to, they don't sing in the choir and work in the children's ministry. <laughs> no, never, never. And, and so I cautioned the reporter, she should be careful yeah. with this narrative. She clearly had a narrative. Christian nationalist attacked the U.S. Capitol building. Um, I, I cautioned her, you might want to be careful based on the evidence you've seen and sent me. I don't see a lot of evidence of what you're trying to argue. She completely ignored me, came out with the story the next day, Christian nationalists have attacked the U.S. Capitol. And she was able to cite a number of scholars, including some reasonable academics, who said things like, this is as Christian nationalist as it gets. And so this really piqued my interest. So I started reading literally everything I could find on the threat of Christian nationalism. And really no one is writing anything about Christian nationalism in this sort of context prior to 2006, when the first book came out arguing that there's this scary movement of Christian nationalists who wanna take over America for Christ and basically oppress everyone except for white Christian males. And um, it, this first book in 2006 was followed by pretty much a book at least every other year and then with the election of Donald Trump, the, the stream of books became a river. It became an avalanche. And everyone all of a sudden is publishing books now about the threat of Christian nationalism. And so this movie that just came out a, about a month ago is most simply a, a slightly different variation of this. So now we have a documentary, a quote unquote documentary, purporting to show that um, there's this massive threat of Christian nationalism. And so, as I said, I, I got curious about this. I started reading the literature and the literature was so bad that I got inspired to write a book largely refuting it. That, that's a bulk of the book explaining why, in fact, Christian nationalism is not a threat to American democracy or the Christian church. Let, let me uh, get a couple of quick definitions. Um, you and I hear the term existential threat a lot and, you know, maybe we use it a lot. But I don't think a lot of people understand what this means. Yes, I think what the critics mean is, in this context, Christian nationalism um, literally is po po posing a threat to American democracy. Our constitutional um, form of government could come to a collapse, and we could collapse into some sort of theocracy run by a dictator, probably Donald Trump, in the eyes of most of the critics. Um, you know, we're just on the brink of this happening. And... Um, it, it, Again, I think this is ridiculous, but I think it's all the more ridiculous when you have Christian authors who are talking about how Christian nationalism is a threat to the Christian church. The Christian church is, is in jeopardy of collapsing, at least in America, because of this, this profound threat, um, which just suggests to me that these folks do not understand Christianity or the church. Um, I watched the uh, the film and I've watched a number of interviews with uh, NPR. We're going to get into this more, but just because you, you triggered a thought, um, that's a line that Reiner uses consistently that this is meant to help the church. This is an attack against the church. Uh, but when I think about an existential threat, when you look at both sides, uh, Republicans and Democrats, they toss that frame a, a, a frame of reference a lot. I can see Schumer saying, this is an existential threat to the country. And I'm going, well, an open border and uh, non-verified elections and uh, voting irregularity is an existential threat. So it seems like the partisan aspect of that terminology, it, it just inflames the voter is my concern. Yeah, no, I think you're right. And you put your finger on something pretty important. You certainly have conservative Christians or conservatives on the right that are sounding the alarm bells as well. And in many cases for equally poor reasons. I, I, I think there's precious little evidence of voter fraud in 2020, certainly not the sort of fraud that would, would throw the election for Biden to Trump 
And yet I, I, I know too many people. I personally know people that are just absolutely convinced that the system is rigged a, a, a against conservatives, against Republicans. This in spite of the fact that Republicans took the House, um, almost certainly will take the Senate. You know, th there just seems to be no connection between the reality that's out there and what's actually um, feared. Now, since we're talking about Christian nationalism, I just read an article by Russ. I never know how to pronounce it. Uh, Ross, is it do it? I can't pronounce his last mm -hmm. name. I'm um, not sure exactly. No. But uh, he's got a New York Times piece that just came out, and he gives four definitions in his take. And I guess he's responding to another author. So let's get Dr. Hall's definition of what is meant by Christian nationalism. So here, I, I don't want to become pedantic, but I need to um, make Well, you're a scholar. We'll give you a little rope. <laughs> So according to the critics, Christian nationalism is a toxic stew of um, those who would conflate Christianity with the United States of America. And in addition to doing that, um, they're racist and they're sexist and they're homophobic and they're militarist. And so they want to use the power of the state, the police power, to absolutely oppress all racial minorities, all religious minorities, to impose white Christian nationalism upon the rest of the nation. Um, so this is a scary thing. And then we get all the more scared when we learn from Samuel Perry and Andrew Whitehead that 51.9% of Americans uh, fully or partially embrace this toxic stew. And then what we have is almost all the critics you know, build off of this. Now, almost all of the measures that have attempted to actually measure Christian nationalism, which generally continue to um, describe it as a scary, toxic stew, have actually ramped this down. So almost all the more reasonable measures come in at about 30% of Americans who embrace this, um, fully or partially embrace this toxic stew. So that's a common definition. My definition is that Christian nationalism is a view that America is specially chosen by God to do his work in the world, and that Christianity should be favored above other faiths by the government. And this favoritism would include things like Congress formally declaring America to be a Christian country, the reintroduction of teacher-led Christian prayers into public schools. So by my measure, this is about 20% of the American public. I offer, as a conservative Christian, I offer what I think are compelling prudential, constitutional, and biblical reasons against even this more benign form of Christian nationalism. But even if these Christian nationalists get their way, and I measure them at about 20% of the American population, what this would do in effect is return America to the 1950s minus racism and segregation and Jim Crow legislation. Um, so it would not be the end of the world. It certainly wouldn't be the end of American constitutional democracy or the Christian church. Again, let me emphasize that I think there's good reasons to reject even this benign form of Christian nationalism, which I do think exists, um, but it's nothing like the Christian nationalism described by the critics. When some of these interviewers and, and experts weigh into this, the, the language, the, the white privilege and the white supremacy is what really struck me, Mark. That it's such a um, it's such a toxic thing to talk about. Anytime you bring racism into something, you know, all of us, I would think, most Americans get very concerned. And that was a little bit surprising to me in this discussion was that the alleged Christian nationalists want to return racism and they want, you know, white men only in pulpits. Did you find this in the either polemical or popular discussions? Certainly all the critics paint this picture of these Christian nationalists as being racist. Now, this is sometimes embarrassing in some of the studies. In the Whitehead and Perry study, for instance, they find that African Americans are actually more likely to be Christian nationalists um, than, than your average American. Uh, but then they immediately d distinguish. They say, well, when African Americans are Christian nationalists, um, they're thinking about the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., they're bringing their faith into the public square for good things. It's only the white Christians who are bringing their faith into the public square for bad things. And here it's almost comical, and I don't want to give your blood pressure a rise, but you look at serious academics like Andrew Whitehead and Samuel Perry, and they literally say things like this. If you are pro-life, you are simply concerned with controlling women's bodies, and therefore you're a sexist. 
If you believe that religious liberty means more than the freedom of worship, you are um, you you are a bigot, and so therefore you're a homophobic, right? And so it's just it, it ridiculous claims, and it completely ignores the reality that women are just as likely to be fully pro life as men. And so this raises a question: Is your wife? Is my wife? Are, are they really concerned with controlling women's bodies? Or might it not be the case that they think unborn babies are human beings that ought to be protected as a matter of law? It seems to me you could be the most secular pro-choice person in America and still re recognize what's going on with most pro-life Americans. And yet these academics who really should know better um, just blow right by this. Now, I would put this up to their um, implicit biases. I, I don't think they're consciously trying to um, tilt the scale in this sort of way. But you see this all the time. And it's profoundly, profoundly concerning. Let's let's talk about the layout of your book. And again, the title, Who's Afraid of Christian Nationalism? Subtitled, Why Christian Nationalism is Not a Threat to American <laughs> Democracy or the Christian Church. And uh, you, you've told the story already about the January uh, 6, 2021 20, experience you had. Talk about the polemic crisis. And again, this is nomenclature we use, but for people that haven't heard the word polemic, I, I teach, you know, the Bible and I talk about Exodus being a polemic against Pharaoh. Help us out for those that may not be familiar with that term. So the, the, the first substantive chapter I call the polemical critics. And by this, I mean, they're critics who generally aren't academics or if they are academics they are leaving their academic um, training behind. And they're just uh, painting this picture of this horrific movement of, of, of theocrats um, bound on destroying America, basically. And they just make, um, they usually simply rely upon assertion. They assert the same thing time and time again. Uh, they're not making a serious academic argument. They're trying to take down um, what they see as this great threat to America. And they make just, you know, they do make some specific factual claims, but when they do so, they're ridiculous claims. They attribute way too much influence to the um, work of an idiosyncratic Calvinist theologian, Rusas Rashduni, whom almost no one has heard of, unless you're an idiosyncratic Calvinist, you probably haven't heard of him, and that's fine. And yet they want to build him up as a father of this modern uh, movement towards theocracy. Um, recognizing that not many people have heard of him, they then make specific factual claims, such as the um, historian David Barton read Rush Dooney and then popularized Rush Dooney, and yet they, um, they, they provide no evidence of this. You read, and I've looked through every book David Barton's ever written, no references to Rush Dooney. I actually reached out to him and said, um, are you influenced by Rush Dooney? And he admitted to me, um, he said, well, I know the name, but I've actually never read any of his books. So one author accuses uh, Marvin Alasky of uh, being a dominionist, a, the a theonomist influenced right by Rush Dooney. So I just reached out to Alasky and I said, um, were you influenced by Rush Dooney? And he wrote a, a charming little email. He said, well, in the early 80s, I ran across his books and at first I was enamored with them, but I got over that very quickly. And to the extent to which I'm anything, it's probably a libertarian, um, not, not, not an advocate of, of theonomy. And I, just for fun, I asked him about Christian nationalism. And he said, yeah, I'm totally against Christian nationalism. And this is, again, one of the fun things. You'll find almost no one who says, I'm a Christian nationalist. Christian nationalism is a good thing. And yet you have all these critics telling stories, um, making assertions, making guesses um, as to um, this, this, this horrific threat. And so again, these are oftentimes journalists or activists. Andrew Seidel, who at the time was with the Freedom From Religion Foundation, now is with Americans United for Separation of Church and State. Um, he admits his book is a polemic. He said, this is not an academic study. This is a polemic. And yet um, the, the halfway serious scholars rely on it. So these academics who are attempting to write academic stuff refer to rely on the polemics by people like Catherine Stewart and Andrew Seidel. So it's just a, a kind of re ridiculous, self-reinforcing echo chamber um, among all the critics, polemical and academic alike. You raise a really important critical thinking point, and, and this is what concerns me about young men and women in their 20s is their consumption of information, I don't even call it journalism or news anymore. Their consumption of information is unsubstantiated. It's opinion, it's clickbait, 
it's uh, exciting, it's quick moving. And uh, I uh, wait, one thing I appreciate about your book, there's footnotes on every single thing. So if you want to know what Stuart said, there's the footnote and you have a hot link if they buy the ebook where they can mm -hmm. go and, and read what the author said. And, you know, tell me, Professor, you know, you're talking to teenage kids in your classes and they get their consumption of information through what TikTok primarily. Um, are they aware that most of this stuff is just opinion? It's just entertainment or do they really believe what they're being, what's a washing them in this information? Yeah. You know, I think they do. I'm not on TikToks. So I'm not familiar. I kind of know what it is, but I'm not on it. They um, are. <laughs> I think by definition, you should be worried if you're getting your information from um, a, a very short video or from a, a, a tweet that is limited in terms of the number of characters and oftentimes doesn't come with any sort of citation or, or, or evidence. Um, I think, you know, I, I think a number of these critics are legitimately worried. They think there's something out there that's scary. And um, then they communicate this to people. And so yeah, I run across young Christians all the time who are concerned with this thing called Christian nationalism. And so I think our job is to help them think more critical of these sorts of claims, as well as the sort of claims that we were talking about earlier from the right that are basically unsubstantiated and ask them, okay, consider who is making the claim. If it's someone from the Freedom From Religion Foundation or the Baptist Joint Committee on Religious Legislation, might they not have an agenda that they are pursuing? And um, maybe you should be a bit skeptical of them. If they're from an, if, if they're academics, um, you know, it, it, attempting to write a bit more seriously on this subject, um, read what they're writing critically and think, okay, are they, are Andrew Whitehead and Samuel Perry actually measuring the thing they're claiming to measure? I think, for instance, not to move too much to the academic literature, but I, th I think they are attempting to measure what they call Christian nationalism. In reality, what they're measuring is the extent to which Americans buy into the strict separation of church and state, a sort of separation that would require a 1925 cross now on public land to be torn down, the sort of separation that would prohibit Ohio from including a Star of David in a Holocaust memorial, uh, certainly a sort of separation that, that would uh, prohibit uh, voucher programs that allow parents to send their children to Christian or Jewish or Muslim schools um, on the same terms that they can send their children to other private schools. And um, and again, some of the questions are, are, are even things like or the statements that people respond to, should prayer be allowed in public schools? Now, think about that for a minute. That is not about teacher led prayer. That's basically saying, should prayer be allowed? Should a child be able to pray over her lunch? Should a young man be able to pray over his math test? Should Islamic students be able to pray at the appropriate time during the day? Should they be allowed to do that? Now, it strikes me if you're a strong advocate of the separation of church and state, maybe you say none of those things should be allowed. I actually think that would be profoundly illiberate. Of course, prayer should be allowed in public schools. What we're concerned about, rightly so, I think it's teacher-led prayer, which has been unconstitutional since 1963. And I think there's very good reasons for Christians to reject teacher-led prayer in public schools, um, both constitutional, prudential, and biblical reasons. Um, and we can talk about those later, if you wish. But what I want to point out is, is Whitehead and Perry just are not measuring the toxic stew of racism, sexism, militarism, and so forth that they claim to be measuring. And I think if you read through that book with an open mind, you th this would leap out to you. And yet far too many people who should know better have read through that book and they just say, well, yeah, that kind of seems right to me. Um, it's, it's just a lot of lack of critical reason. You point out in your book, almost no American claimed to be a Christian nationalist until the summer of 2022, when Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene embraced the label. And that is features prominently in the film God and Country. Uh, shortly thereafter, Doug Wilson, the provocative pastor at Christ Church, Moscow, Idaho, argued the concept is salvageable. And so, uh, I mean, Doug Wilson's got a tribe without question. But I wouldn't call him a you know a, a grand spokesperson on these issues. But you know, M MTG is she's a vitriolic, you know, off the cuff, loud person in in her comments. But it kind of stops there. You know, she is the only elected member of Congress to identify as a Christian nationalist. Now, sometimes people assert, and I was talking with an academic who, again, should know 
better. He should know that he should find evidence to support a claim. But he was right away, well, no, no, no. What about Lauren Boebert of, uh, of Colorado? And I said, well, where does she embrace the label of Christian nationalist? And he couldn't find anything. I took the extra step of contacting her congressional office. And her press secretary told me she rejects that label because she associates it with the sort of patriarch patriarchal views, patriarchal views of Stephen Wolf and other advocates who basically say things like married women should not vote in the United States of America. And they certainly shouldn't serve as members of Congress. And so, of course, a serving member of Congress is going to reject that label. And again, I think I think it's telling for those who would have us believe that Christian nationalists are everywhere. You only have one elected member of Congress. Maybe if you get down to the state level, you could find a couple of others. There were a few candidates in 2022 who I think embrace the label. But again, it's telling. Almost no one does. Even Doug Wilson is pretty careful about it. Note that he says it's salvageable. And what he does, he goes on to define what he means by Christian nationalist. By a nationalist, he just means that he favors an international order characterized by nation states, as opposed to one global government or an international order of failed states where you don't have nations, where you have tribes and gangs and that sort of thing. Well, if that's what you mean by nation nationalism, I guess I'm on board with that. And then he argues, not unreasonably, that any nation's going to be characterized by, for want of a better word, some sort of worldview. This could be Islam, it could be secularism, it could be Christianity. And he says, as a Christian, my preference is that it would be characterized by Christianity. And so therefore I'm a Christian nationalist, but he goes out of his way to make it clear that America is not specially chosen by God, um, that racism is a grave evil um, and so forth and so on. He's obviously against militarism, one of the ironic things is all of these Calvinists who advocate for Christian nationalism, a Doug Wilson, a Stephen Wolf, a Torber, and Isker, they actually aren't nationalists. They're localists. They want to see power devolve to very local units like counties. And um, so they really aren't interested in the United States as a nation. Um, Stephen Wolf specifically says the United States is a failed country. There's no hope for the United States of America. The best we can hope for is that some small part of the United States might break away and become a Christian nation. That is not how most of us use the term nation. Uh, I remember Wilson, I think Wilson, is, isn't he have kind of effort to turn Moscow, Idaho into a Christian city? You know, this is a claim and, um, and, and it's a ridiculous claim. ABC, I think it was, had a, a long special on this. Right. And um, yeah, basically, Moscow is a, um, a, a bright blue city in a deep red state. And so maybe 10% of the city is aligned with Doug Wilson and his values. Uh, but those wouldn't just be people that go to his church, right? There's some other conservative Christian churches in Moscow where they would say things like if they were able to, they would ban abortion in the, in, in, in the town of Moscow. They would certainly ban drag queen story hours in the town of Moscow. Uh, but they're also crystal clear there wouldn't be an established church, religious minorities wouldn't be persecuted, and so forth and so on. Now, one thing, without getting too into the weeds, I, I think one thing that's critically important to recognize about Rush Dooney, Wilson, Wolf and others is that they are all post-millennial post-millennial Calvinist. They all believe that the kingdom of God is advancing. The gates of hell will not withstand it. Eventually, more and more people will become Christians, and society will become far more Christians. And so, they were, what they're doing is they're working out this project: what would the, uh, the eventual Christian society look like? And they're basically um, spinning out what they think it would look like. And it, again, involves things like I just mentioned, abortion would be banned, you want to have drag queen story hours, and so forth and so on. This is a project that is going to be attractive to very few American Christians. Sure. Because most let, Americans let me interrupt you for a second. When yeah. you, you earlier mentioned dominion theology, mm -hmm. and I would almost pair that with what you just articulated. Is that fair or incorrect? Absolutely right. There's a close connection between being a post-millennial Calvinist and theonomy or dominionism and that sort of thing. Even back when Rush Dooney was getting some press in the, in, in the 80s, you had two of Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson, of course, are always being accused of being theonomist or dominionist. Um, but two of Jerry Falwell's right-hand men wrote an article saying, look, most American evangelicals are not post-millennialists. 
they're premillennials, premillennial dispensationalists. And so therefore, this Calvinist project is not going to be of interest to the vast majority of American evangelicals, or I would say more broadly, the vast majority of American Christians. It is of interest to a, a, a very tiny slice of Calvinists. And I say this as someone fairly sympathetic to Calvinist theology, but we need to recognize we're talking about a very small handful of people in America. And as I always caveat, uh, most people who call themselves Calvinists don't really know what John Calvin taught, <laughs> much less the Synod of Dort and the Five Points, but that's another conversation. Um, in your last chapter, you offer, you say, a biblical and theological reason for reject reasons for rejecting Christian nationalism in all its forms. I argue that it is appropriate for Christians to be patriotic and to bring our faith into the public square. So let's differentiate with a topic like uh, abortion and the Hobbes decision, Roe v. Wade, um, a legislative process, elected officials uh, went back to the Supreme Court, and it was, I would say, ostensibly, everyone, even pro-choice people would say, it was a bad law. But the the uh, flashpoint of saying you can't have an abortion, they didn't understand, no, it's just going back to states' rights. So as individual Christians, we vote, they say some vote pro-life, pro-choice, it goes to the ballot, it goes to the elected official, it becomes a, a bill, it becomes a law, the process is different. By the time it hits the Supreme Court and they make a ruling, that's the three branches of government. You could blame either side from a moral perspective, whether the pro-choice argument wins or the pro-life arguments wins. This is how the public square functions. So why are, and maybe it's a stupid question, but why is there a fear is this go back to the existential threat that Christian nationalism somehow is going to mandate you can't have an abortion, which it did not in the Hobbes decision. Even I wouldn't attribute it to Christian nationalists, but even if you did, right? Sorry for the prattling there, but I, th I think yeah. you see where I'm going with the question. No, I think so. So let me um, let me begin by by agreeing with you. I think everyone by this point recognizes that Roe versus Wade was very bad constitutional law. The U.S. Supreme Court tried to rehabilitate the constitutional reasoning in Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Uh, but again, that, that decision has been hotly, hotly criticized. And so eventually the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. In part, it did so because Christians had organized themselves into legal advocacy groups like the Christian Legal Society, Alliance Defending Freedom, First Liberty. And these folks made arguments, and they consistently made arguments over a long period of time saying that Roe versus Wade is bad law. The U.S. Supreme Court finally agreed and tossed it out. So the practical results of this, as you very accurately said, is it returns the issue of abortion to the states. So states like the state I'm in right now, the great state of Oregon, can protect a woman's right to have abortion at any period um, throughout a pregnancy, and it can adopt policies saying that health insurance plans must cover abortion at no cost. And the great state of Oregon actually will provide um, funds for abortion if you don't have insurance, whether you're in the state legally or not, right? And so the state of Oregon has the freedom under the Dobbs decision to embrace policies like this. On the other hand, a state like Alabama has the freedom to embrace a policy saying that abortion is murder, it shall be illegal unless it's medically necessary to save the life of the mother or something like that, uh, a, a limitation that almost every Christian that I know of who's pro-life agrees with. And yet we recognize that a tiny fraction, a tiny, tiny fraction of 1% of abortions are actually medically necessary to save the life of the mother. And so the question becomes then, is it appropriate for Christians to um, engage in politics? Um, I, I spend most of the year now in the, in the purple state of Virginia. And so in the purple state of Virginia, is it reasonable for me to advocate for laws restricting abortion, to vote based on my con conviction that abortion is murder, to perhaps lobby legislators, to perhaps run for office myself one day? Is it permissible for me to be motivated by my Christian convictions that all human life is, is created in the Imago Dei and must be treated with respect and dignity? Uh, my conviction that people should be treated justly, and this certainly involves them not being killed. Um, is, is that a re reasonable thing for me to do? And I, I, I think I would contend it absolutely is, and this is not Christian nationalism in any meaningful sense of the term. 
But I also go on to chasten some of my pro-life conservative Christians. I, I think when we advocate for pro-life legislation, we need to do so in, in a um, humble manner. We need to assume that our opponents aren't actually desiring to see babies killed. I, I, I don't think that's the case, right? They have other views with respect to a woman's right to control her body, and we need to recognize where they're coming from and then attempt to engage them with reasoned arguments and not just yell at them, right? And so, yeah, I, I think it's entirely appropriate for Christians to advocate for policies that they believe are required by the Bible or, or, or morality generally. And of course, I would apply this, and I think all of us would agree today, that what the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. did in the Civil Rights Movement was eminently um, a, a appropriate. And he was clearly motivated by his uh, his Christian faith, and thank goodness he was. And um, yeah, there, this is not problematic, and it's not Christian nationalism in any meaningful sense. Even the sort of benign definition that I give it, it's not Christian nationalism, because we aren't talking about favoring Christianity over other religions. We're talking about protecting innocent human life. Let's come back to Public Square for a minute. So I'm I'm a engineer. I'm a uh, businessman. Uh, maybe both husband and wife work outside the home. Maybe one works. They have a couple of kids. They have a mortgage. They might have a car payment. Um, they go to a, a good church, uh, teaches the Bible. They're evangelical, fundamental, Baptist, Bible-believing Christians. And they want to throw their hands up, Dr. Hall, and say, my vote doesn't matter. I can't engage the public square. I don't want to get involved in these fights. And you, you experience, I experience in small amount, but when you step out and write a book like this, you're going to have lots of critics come down on you and say all kinds of unkind things. I mean, our, our YouTube uh, comments can be pretty exciting sometimes. Um, and, and they don't want to do that, Mark. They want to, you know, they want to go home after church, have a Sunday supper, take a little nap, maybe watch football, love their kids and grandkids. So when we say public square, that can be intimidating to a lot of Americans. Sure. And let me um, right away recognize that people have different calls in their life. So I felt called to engage um, in the realm of politics uh, for about 15, 20 years through more academic circles for the last five years, um, aiming for the general reading public. So I'm trying to persuade people. Um, which I, I think is eminently appropriate, but I recognize that most Christians aren't going to feel called to write books or op-eds or all sorts of articles on, on this subject. That's fine. You know, we, we, we're all going to be doing different things. I personally don't feel called to run for office. Some Christians do, right? So we have different callings in our lives. I would say that in a place like the United States of America, American citizens have a, 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 a responsibility to be engaged in politics. We all have the right to vote. Um, we all should vote. And when we vote, we should take into account um, our Christian faith, the, what, what our faith requires of us. And we should look at the issues that matter and issues that can matter. And we should ask our candidates, um, are, are, are they advocating for justice and equality? for all Americans. And depending on where we are, that might look a bit, look a bit different. And I, I don't want to ever suggest that we should be single issue voters, uh, but I do think something like um, the sanctity of human life strikes me as an obviously important issue. Um, things like religious liberty. And I want to be clear, I want to protect the ability of all Americans to act according to the religious convictions whenever possible. So this isn't just religious liberty for Christians, um, but it's for Jews and Sikhs and, and Muslims as well. And I don't say that as a relativist. I will try to convince any Jew or Muslim or Sikh of the truths of Christianity. But I think that has to be done without the coercion of the state. And absent their conversion, they should be free to act according to their religious convictions whenever possible. I think we have to be concerned with the uh, most vulnerable among us, um, ho homeless populations, for instance. And we should be thinking, how might these homeless populations best be helped? That may involve the government. It might not involve the government. It might be involved in working through your church to support a ministry aimed at homeless people. But I think we have to be concerned with these things um, as, as Christian citizens in a country where we have the ability to make a difference. If we were Christians in North Korea, maybe we'll just keep our heads down and pray. But we aren't Christians in North Korea. We live in the United States of America, and therefore we have the responsibility to act. And I would say the same thing to citizens of England or France or any other functioning democracy. Let's let's change subjects. Uh, uh, well, 
direction a bit and talk about this uh, new film, God and Country. Um, it was uh, really a, a provocation by a book by Catherine Stewart, who you have referenced. Her book is called The Power Worshippers Inside the Dangerous Rise of Religious Nationalism. And uh, the producer is, I mean, Rob Reiner is the headliner, but uh, Dan Partland really was the one who did the film. And correct me if I'm wrong, in my investigation, Rob Reiner had nothing to do with it other than to put his name and money on it. Uh, Parkland was the one who did all the real heavy lifting. And I think Reiner saw it as a finished product, basically. So he wasn't involved in selecting or scripting or anything. So I, I could be wrong on that, but I did read that. Now, the question comes, uh, it opened uh, in very small theater releases. It's going to be on Apple TV on March 21st. Um, you've seen it. You wrote a great op-ed, or, or rather a response or review, which you have the link in the show notes. It's a very succinct, e accessible article from Dr. Hall to read. But let's, let's start at the high level of this of this documentary. Um, mm -hmm. g give us your kind of assessment of the you talked about fear mongering earlier and, and you, you have the same opinion of the film. Yes. I would class this film with the polemical literature and it's telling that it relies on Catherine Stewart's books. I would, I, I classify her book as, as part of this literature. It relies heavily on Andrew Seidel and Bob Boston of Americans United for separation of church and state. And um, Reiner himself, of course, historically has been no friend of Christianity. I, I think he's actually been critical of religion identifies as, a, as, a, as an atheist, I believe, to this day. And so it really is telling. Again, this is a critical thinking. We should be concerned, maybe, or at least start asking questions when Rob Reiner, the atheist, says, yeah, I'm really concerned that Christian nationalist, nationalism is a threat to American democracy and the Christian and church. The church. Yeah. Yeah. So since when did you become concerned about the Christian <laughs> church? Now, uh, maybe he is, right? Yeah, could be. Yeah. And people change and this sort of thing. One, and I think your timeline is right because one of the um, once it became evident he was involved, people started asking, um, was it prudent for Christians like David French, French and Russell Moore to um, serve as talking heads for this documentary? And it, it does appear that I, I think they even said they weren't aware that he had any involvement with it, and if they were, they might not have participated in it. So, um, you know, I, I think part of the problem with Christian nationalism, and, and I should, I might have made this distinction earlier, there are, and you know this, of course, there are racist in America, there are sexist in America, there are militarist in America, there are people who would use violence to overthrow the regime. I think we saw part of that on January 6th among those people who attacked the U.S. Capitol building. Um, it was a crime. I'm horrified by it. And those people should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. We saw this among the 300 or so people that gathered at the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville. So there are dangerous people out there. And of course, it's possible then for Reiner then to find some videotape of people saying kind of crazy, racist, sexist things. They can also find Greg Locke, that inflammatory pastor in Tennessee, saying just ridiculous things. And yeah, he has a tent full of people that think he's um, you know, God's gift to mankind. And then, of course, you find less offensive people that conflate God and country in, in the church in ways that make me cringe. Um, I don't think they're racist. I don't think they're sexist. But I think they do bring God and country a bit too much together. Um, for my taste, and I, I think it's problematic. So you watch this documentary, and you do see things that as a conservative Christian will make you cringe, I think, right? And then I think you have people like David French and Russell Moore, whom generally I think well of, and I think they see this sort of thing, maybe they've experienced this sort of thing, and so they're inclined to buy into this, um, in, in, into this fear that there are lots of people out there with really scary views and so they're showing a legitimate concern that this stuff is going on in the American churches. And so I think they're just simply an error. But then your Andrew Seidel's and Bob Boston's, I, I think there really is an agenda there, which is to shame conservative Christians, to make it seem inappropriate for us to bring our faith into the public square, to advocate for things that we think our faith de demands, such as religious liberty for all, um, and the sanctity of human life, and that sort of thing. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I've, I've followed French and uh, Russell Moore. I wouldn't call them close friends, but I, they're acquaintances over the years. 
And uh, Russell Moore has changed a lot in his opinions. I think the the Trump cycle disenfranchised so many Christians. And uh, I mean, notwithstanding, for some good reasons, you know, you want to be aligned with this when, you know, a decade ago, those things were reprehensible and now they're acceptable. And, you know, partisan politics, of course, it's a vitriolic game because we can we can lambast one side for one thing and one side for another. And it's actually the same coin. Um, but you get them emboldened as a Christian. You say, wait a minute, I don't believe that or I do believe that. Or if I don't vote for Trump, I'm voting for, you know, and it's this is very difficult. Uh, we, we talk a lot about this may be one of the more divisive times in our country, which I, I fuss with when I think about the Civil War. But yeah, but, but that being said, um, I understand in principle. But as I've tried to say, you know, I'm pastoring on and off over the years and not from the pulpit, but I said, you know, you may not like candidate A or B, but there's a platform behind those candidates. There's an overall emphasis. There is a, a, a without question, a pro-life or a pro-death viewpoint. There is, without question, an open border or a, some kind of reform immigration policy. These aren't, these aren't that hard to differentiate from. And sure, maybe I'll hold my nose for candidate A or B, but to not vote or to pull back. And, and, and Russell, and both David have said some pretty interesting things. That I kind of, I go, well, what's the option? Because the, the uh, no labels is not going anywhere. And I have friends involved with it. It's not going to go anywhere. Third party is not going anywhere. So now we're left with this fold our arms. That's why I talked about voter irregularity. Um, back to the public square question for you. You know, it, it, I, it's like there was a stupid movie years ago and the two guys were fighting over something and the one gets caught doing something. He goes, head or gut? Meaning you want me to punch you in the head or punch you in the gut? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's kind of like, which one do I want to do, Mark? Yeah, no, that's tough. I, right now I'm teaching a 200 level American political thought class. And you know, one, one of the assignments I just gave the students, I haven't read them yet. I said, I want you to write basically a 2,000, 3,000 word essay about who Christians should vote for president of the United States in 2024. And so I want you to, you know, explain why this person, you know, should be supported. And you can draw from, you know, the scripture and Christian theology and make your arguments. And I said, look, you're perfectly welcome to argue that Christians should vote for either Donald Trump or Joe Biden, the likely nominees. If you do that, I want you to explain why, for instance, we should vote for uh, Donald Trump in light of his you know, profound moral failings and sometimes his, his racist language and that sort of thing. If you want to argue we should vote for Biden, explain why Christians should vote for this obviously pro-life candidate. But I gave them the option as well. You are perfectly welcome to argue that we should cast our votes for a third party candidate. But if you do so, you have to explain why, in effect, it's better to do that than vote for the lesser of two evils. And I think if you look at Donald Trump... And Let I me interrupt you. Let me interrupt you. Yeah. See, you've done what a professor is supposed to do. You're teaching young minds to be critical thinkers. You know, I had a debate class 100 years ago in college I was in, and we had a, a pro-choice or a pro-life debate. You had to come to class prepared to do either one. And yeah. then you were assigned... Not, not the position you wanted, you were assigned a position and you had to debate. You had to marshal forth the evidence, understand what the responses were going to be, know how to block and bridge. We had all of our three by fives with periodical references and quotes. We had to be ready. And I thought I hated it, but it was a brilliant way to teach critical thinking. And that's exactly what you've articulated. And sadly, what's probably lost in most universities, but I'm way off now. Sorry. I just thank you for doing it. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. And that's exactly um, a, a major point behind that. So, um, yeah, so so, so I'm, I'm perfectly open to the idea that a Christian shouldn't support either of the two major party candidates, but we should recognize the, the, the cost of that. If, if, if a lot more Christians had taken the view that Donald Trump is beyond the pale in 2016, we would have had a Hillary Clinton presidency. We want to have three excellent U.S. Supreme Court justices that then turned about and turned over, Rover, overturned Roe versus Wade that have been incredibly good on religious liberty and church-state relations. So that would be a profound cost that we well, would have. you remember before the Trump election for what we're doing right this moment, 
uh, public radio, Christian radio, non-com radio, that was all in jeopardy in the, in the Obama administration. They were moving to eradicate religious freedom in, in the marketplace. And I mean, there were a lot of broadcasters on their heels going, this is terrifying. So, you know, we tend to vote for our constituent emotional a- appropriation. Well, I want that candidate. And um, again, I'm digressing, but when, when we saw Trump Christian pastors praying for him, I'm holding my nose and shaking my head going, why are some of these people in the Oval? I mean, my word, Mm -hmm. it's politics. You've got constituents. You have to, quote, accommodate. So that's where I think we get uh, so torqued, Mark, is, is, you know, I read your book, it amps me up. I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I go, but I feel like head or gut. (laughs) No, it's it, it's a problem, and you know, as I argue in parts of the book, it is telling that evangelicals supported almost any candidate in the Republican primaries in 2016, except Donald Trump. You know, Ben Carson, Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz. You know, evangelicals like them. It was only at, in, in Trump's most uh, most um, important supporters early on were non-religious Americans, especially blue collar whites who had been left out of the global economy. Once Trump got the nomination, I think Christians had to decide, okay, is it Trump or Clinton? And a good number, especially those evangelicals with greater education, held their nose and voted for Donald Trump. I I, I do think too many Americans have become too enamored with Donald Trump, to my way of thinking anyway, especially Christians who should know better. You could recognize maybe I should vote for him, but I don't have to love the guy. I don't have to accept him uncritically. I I think if we can return back to French and Moore, both of them, of course, were never Trumpers, and both of them were in context, especially Moore and the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, where they got a lot of pushback from people. Um, You know, Tim Alberta has a a, a recent book that came out, you know, just a few weeks ago, or maybe more than that, but I read it a few weeks ago, and he does some good reporting, and he, he chatted with them. You know, people would approach the Frenches in church, and, and, and attack them, in effect, for being never Trumpers. And so I think the reaction to that sort of thing perhaps pushes them to be a bit more vocal than um, about the evils of Christian nationalism. Whereas I, you know, I write on the topic, I get some pushback, but my day-to-day life really isn't adversely well, affected. But you're, you're in an academic realm and you're in a book publishing realm primarily, right? And, right? and so these guys are a little more populist, whether it's CT or an op-ed. And, um, and, and they made a name for themselves in a way mm-hmm. becoming never Trumpers. And, um, the other one is Rob Shank. You know, I've scratched my head at Rob's trajectory for many years. So I'm going, you know, what happened? Um, that being said, you know, we're, we're in the Christian community. We're in a marketplace of public ideas. I go to a church. I like this pastor, not that pastor. I'm pre mill, not post mill or whatever. And it becomes so, you know, mind boggling again, I think the average Christian, well-intentioned man or woman, they want to do the right thing, but they don't have the critical thinking track record to understand. So we're pushed by emotion and that's the red meat we see with these always Trumpers or always, you know, Democrats or whatever, however you want to label it. But it's, it's heartening that you're in there fighting the fight. And, um, we would digress from the film. Any other comments you had about the documentary God and country, which again, I would encourage people to watch, um, but I would also add this. In a documentary like this, know that they filmed these people for a couple of hours, and they took one little 90-second or 30-second bite. So even the way Russell Moore and David French may or may not be characterized, they probably said some other really good things that were on the cutting room floor. But anyway, final thoughts about the the, uh, the documentary. Yes, I, I, I... I agree. I would encourage people to watch the documentary. I would encourage them not to pay to watch it, right? As I unfortunately had to do because I was writing a review of it. Uh, but well, watch it critically. And then I, and without being too self-promotional, I'd encourage them to get my book, Who's Afraid of Christian Nationalism. It's aimed at the general reading public. So it's not an academic book. Although, as you point out, I do have footnotes. So if you have any Which questions. Which I love. I love. Yeah, thank you. And, and you should have footnotes. Because if you have questions, did such and such really say that? Or what's his evidence for these numbers? You can go track it down. So the text should be reader friendly, but I provide all the supporting um, information that one would need to then judge my book, right? So I'm not asking anyone to take my book at face value. 
uh, but watch the documentary, read my book, and decide which one makes more sense. Dr. Mark David Hall, I would talk to you all afternoon, but you've got classes and we've got more work to do. But thanks for being on the podcast. As uh, we mentioned on the front end, all the information is in the show notes. And I would encourage you to buy Mark's new book. It comes out in April. Uh, you can probably pre-order it anywhere you buy a book online. It'll be shipped to you. I'm sure it'll be available in e-format if you're a uh, Kindle user or other electronic book application. Um, but this is the kind of book, you know, a lot of times we have authors on in context, and we know they might be out of your area of interest. We had some really brilliant Hebrew professor or whatever, and you go, ah, I'm not. this is an accessible book for you as an American who happens to be a believer in Jesus Christ, who happens to be an American. And I think rather than lose all hope, which I can tend to do, is this kind of thing provokes me to thinking. And then what's the next step for you? How God might use this book in your life, in your neighborhood, your community group, your Sunday school class as just a provocative way. Can we talk about this without losing our emotional control? So with that said, thanks again, Mark, for joining us on the program. Thank you very much, Michael. It's been my pleasure. 